episode of Surviving the Survivor. We bring you the best guests in all of true crime. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button. Here's your host, Emmy Award winning broadcaster, Joel Walton. What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring all of you the very best guests in true crime. And you've got two of the best, best guests tonight. I promise the the hat is not uh, an official new part of the wardrobe, although it is a, I got to get Chance and Monica one of these. I have one. I have one. You don't have this embroidered one that says best no, guests no. in true crime. I will have to get you that. However, um, Carm cautioned me. She's like, don't talk too much about yourself. Well, today I was going to have a Joel day, and I was driving on 95th Street here in Miami Beach. When um, it's a, it's like got an island in the middle, beautiful palm trees, car traffic on one side, traffic on the other side. I'm heading west away from the beach. About to have a Joel day, just collect myself, you know, get even keeled, find my zen. When a feral cat decides to run into the road and being the animal lover that I am, although I like dogs better than cats, I still swerved uh, to save this cat's life, which I did. But my tire hit the cement, as they say in Tallahassee or somewhere, and... Um, my tire basically blew up. So I spent the next six hours waiting for a tow truck. Uh, the lovely COE joined me on part of that journey. And I just got back within three seconds of being able to do the show. So, uh, the COE was, um, was by my side for some of it. And, uh, luckily no vertigo for her. We seem to be stabilizing somewhat. And that is a day in the life of the Waldman family. So there you go. Um, without further ado, let me tell you about the story. And uh, for everyone who's been following the Adelson story, this is, as they say, or as Yogi Berra once said, deja vu all over again. Eerily similar uh, to Dan Markell and the Adelsons. Back on the evening of February 16th, 2022, Jared Bridegan had just dropped off his nine-year-old twin son and daughter, twins, a son and daughter, at his ex-wife's home. Her name is Shanna Gardner, and uh, that home is in Jacksonville Beach, Florida, not that far away from Tallahassee as far as the uh, crow flies, probably a few hours, if that. Mm -hmm. um, he was headed back to St. Augustine, which is where he lived. I think that is the oldest town in America, if I'm correct about that. Uh, with his two-year-old daughter, so Jared Bridegan, with his two-year-old daughter uh, from a new wife, uh, he was remarried in the car, he stopped because there's, there's a tire in the middle of the road uh, near the exit, and he can't get around it. So he stops and moves that tire, and then in what police believe was a planned attack, he is shot multiple times. Dan Markell shot multiple times as he apparently attempted to move the tire. His vehicle's hazard lights were still blinking with his daughter sitting in her car seat unharmed. Bridegan, Jared Bridegan, was laying dead in the road. Many families, once again, inexorably damaged as a result of what transpired that fateful day. We're going to get into some of the details. Um, this is also, this involves a death penalty, uh, which is why we have Monica Jordan here on top of many other reasons that we have her. But of course, you know, Tim Jansen, Famed Tallahassee defense attorney. He is a partner in the firm that bears his name, Jansen and Davis. I've been inside that office. It's a beautiful office. He has handled complex civil, administrative, and criminal litigation. First as chief trial counsel for the Secretary of State of Florida, handling, again, both complex civil and criminal, criminal matters. And then he spent five years as a federal prosecutor, and no one knows Northern Florida, which Tim says is more like the South than South Florida, which is true, like Tim Jansen. And next up, Monica Jansen, whose light literally and figuratively is improving every Monica, time. We're married now. Oh, she's still, did I just call her Monica Jansen? You did. You did. Oh, and his Monica Jordan. His daughter, Jeez. not his wife. My daughter. <laughs> <laughs> Monica Jordan is the president of Jordan Research and Consulting one of the nation's most sought after private investigators. She's just in a word, a badass. Monica really is. 
She's handled more than 50 death penalty trials. And Shanna Gardner and her husband uh, in this case, Mario Fernandez Saldana, both of them are facing the death penalty. Um, Monica has worked with Eileen Warnos. If you ever saw the movie Monster with Charlize Theron, that is her. Uh, Monica worked with the real live person, not with Charlize Theron. So um, she knows the ins and outs. If you can, please follow us on uh, Patreon. Feel free to become a member. On YouTube, feel free to become a member. Audio is hugely important to what we do and trying to do here in terms of creating content. So um, if you, you can't support us, I understand that, but please support us with a five-star review and please listen to us on audio whenever you're in the car as opposed uh, to, you know, on YouTube. I prefer if you listen to us in the car on the audio podcast. So first and most obvious question uh, with this is who was Jared Bridegan? You hear a lot about him being um, a Microsoft executive. Well, he was a lot more than that. He was a 33-year-old father. He had two children with his ex-wife, Shanna Gardner, and uh, she lived, as I said, in Jackson, Jacksonville Beach. And he had a current wife, Kirsten Bridegan, uh, who lives in St. Augustine. So he had, uh, she had, Kirsten did, two children with Jared um, and is now sadly a uh, widow and a full-time mom. She was an account manager before that. So she now runs something called justice for Jared B Jared Bridegan. And she's been proactive in trying to make sure that Jared's story is not forgotten. Uh, we have reached out or in the process of reaching out right now to try to get her on the show. Um, there are a lot of different players in this, just like the Adelson story. But before we kind of really get into the weeds on this, Monica, I'm actually going to go to you first here because you handle death penalty cases, obviously the most serious type of case uh, that anyone can handle. Uh, what are the steps right now? And you handle uh, the defendant side. So you would be representing or, or being you're not an attorney, to be clear, but you'd be the investigator for someone like Shanna Gardner or Mario Fernandez Saldana, uh, the new husband of Shanna Gardner. What would you be doing in these stages right now? The trial is not set to start till April. So if I was <clears throat> coming in just as the mitigation specialist to work on the death penalty portion of this, the original, the, the right out of the gate, you would start conducting forensic social, uh, social interviews of the client to know everything about our life story. Um, the guilt phase investigator would be working on the whole I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I didn't do it phase. We call that the guilt phase, the fact finding phase. And then as from the mitigation phase, we'd be figuring out how did you get caught up in this? How, how, how can we explain to the jury why your life is worth um, sparing? So you don't get the death penalty right now. We're in a unique situation in Florida. Uh, Governor DeSantis, we have, we, the United States Supreme court sent it back saying we have to have a unanimous verdict in the penalty phase in order for you to be able to execute somebody in Florida. Governor DeSantis changed that in the last session earlier uh, last year, or actually this year, to an 8-4 standard, um, which is still kind of being litigated. And I think that is, a you know, the case will go forward under the 8-4, the new 8-4 statute, but it's a little problematic. So uh, that's that's kind of where you're at. But right now, all the the lawyers for Shanna is are coming in right now and they have to file their notice of death penalty qualifications. And um, I, I don't think Jose Baez is death qualified, but he brings in people that are and she can waive lead counsel not being death qualified as long as they've got other teammates on the team that are death qualified. And um that's that's probably what's taking place. He's brought in uh, Ron Sullivan from Harvard, and he's also brought in um, Patrick Carity. And we can get into that in a minute about why that's such a better a, a better strategy than what we've seen in the Markel case with all these lawyers coming up from Miami to this rural community. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so Mr. Baez has done a great job of kind of putting together a better team. Uh, and I do want to get just taking some notes, actually. So I remember to come back to that. 
and uh, we will do that. Uh, Tim, uh, we're looking at a photo in Monica of Jared Bridegan, obviously a, a handsome guy, and you see him. He has twins from his first marriage to the woman now accused of plotting to murder him uh, and facing the death penalty. Those are the older twins. And then you see him with his younger children uh, with his wife, Kirsten Bridegan, who is now sadly a widow. Uh, but Tim Jansen, Jose Baez, a lot of people are commenting. For those who don't know, uh, Casey Anthony's attorney um, and um, why am I blanking on his first name? Hernandez. What is his first name? Aaron, Aaron Hernandez. Aaron Hernandez. I don't know. I kept wanting to say Alex. I don't know why. So Aaron Hernandez is attorney as well. What What do we know, Tim, about Jose Baez? Well, Aaron, uh, Baez was not, he's not what we call a silk stocking lawyer. He got the case of Casey Anthony by, he knew Casey, he was representing Casey's roommate, cellmate, and somehow he was able to get on, on the case. A lot of the criminal defense lawyers in Orlando thought he was over his head. He didn't have the pedigree, didn't pay the dues. Um, so what he is, though, he's a he's a fighter. He's a scrapper. He's in the courtroom. He knows how to sell a jury. He knows how to build trust with the jury. And he knows how to present a case, which are all valuable in these kind of cases. Because if you don't trust the lawyer, you're not going to believe him. Uh, I, I would say he's completely the opposite of Daniel Rashbaum. I think that Baez is a fighter. He takes he, he he does it like a general in a war. He finds the weak parts. He's able to convince jurors that to sell his story, which is great. And, you know, everybody can win one case and become OK. Hey, a bad case for the state can make a good a bad lawyer look good and vice versa. A bad case for the defense can make the lawyer look bad. But he also did the Aaron Hernandez case. Um, and he was able to uh, get an acquittal in that case. Um, so he's got re he's got results that the state needs to can make sure they understand they're they're going to be into a fight, which is um, which they know they're going to be in now. They don't have death qualified lawyers. But Jose is not to be taken lightly. Um, he pushes the envelope for sure. Um, he's not a potted plant. And um, I, I think it's going to be interesting. I'm curious to see how he can manipulate the facts in this case because they they seem like they have a pretty strong case against Shanna. Yeah, and we're going to find that out in April when the trial starts. By the way, this Friday, either 9 or 9.30, I'm still trying to nail it down, there is uh, her second hearing in Duval County. That is for Shanna Gardner. And Tim Jansen and I are going to bring that to you live with some uh, colorful commentary from Tim, the same way we did it uh, during the Adelson trial. Tim is uh, an MVP at that. So we're going to do that Friday morning. I'm going to post that on Twitter at Podcast STS, on uh, Instagram at Surviving the Survivor. Uh, Karen Michael uh, motive. We're going to get to that in a minute, but uh, the two of them, Jared Bridegan and uh, Shanna Gardner were divorced in 2015. Uh, it appears it was a custody battle, a really ugly custody battle. And, and a lot of times you hear people say family court is way more dangerous than criminal court. And uh, this could be a case in point uh, to you, Monica. Megan says she will not meaning Shanna Gardner. She will not get the death penalty in Duval County, I admittedly admittedly do not know much about Duval County, which is where Jacksonville is. Why do you think Megan is saying this is an accurate comment? Um, <clears throat> I actually agree with Megan. Yep. Uh, I she's not the shooter. Uh, she may be the mastermind. I, I don't know. I don't know enough about the facts of how it's all intertwined. I was often thinking that the new husband and the trigger man may have colluded and, and been more of the co-conspirators. And she may have a great defense that says, you know, my new husband went rogue. Um, I wasn't involved. Obviously there's, there's some connection or she wouldn't have been charged. Um, but I, it's really, really tough to get death for the non-shooter. And, and I believe the defense will make a big to do about giving a the deal, shooter. a second degree, a second degree deal to the actual shooter. Yeah. 
Um, and I have a whole host of opinions about this new husband and the shooter. But I, I agree with Megan. I don't I don't see. Listen, you you operate and prepare like they're going to kill your client and you prepare for that and you do everything in your power to prevent that if that's what you're retained to do. But my overall opinion is, in my experience, the non shooter is not does not get the needle. Uh, interesting. KCL, who knows this case super well, she's on top of a lot of cases, uh, but I know she runs um, some sort of chat on this particular case. Two adorable daughters with Kirsten uh, and beautiful boy girl twins he had with Shanna are the four children Jared left behind when he was heinously murdered. And there you're looking at Shanna Gardner um, in a prison jumpsuit or jail jumpsuit. And then, of course, on the other side, when she was still in civilian clothing. Monica, just back to you real quickly on this comment from Yala. All these death penalty convictions under the new rule are going to be overturned and become uh, LWAP, which is life without parole, I bet, right? What are the chances this new rule survives, Monica? Uh, well, there's people appealing it now. I don't even know. Back when I was doing one in the in the summer, we didn't even have jury instructions under this new law. Mm -hmm. That that may have changed. Um It, it will be it'll be an interesting appellate issue down the road if she's convicted and gets death because the United States Supreme Court sent all of these cases back to be resentenced because they said it has to be a unanimous verdict. Um, you know, our our governor passed, leg, you know, signed legislation that he wants it to be eight, four. So I, I think anytime, this is my overall opinion on this. Um, anytime you tinker with the death penalty, trying to make it more efficient to execute uh, defendants, you screw it up. If you just follow the process and you give the defense what they're asking for, you could probably execute people left and right. But what happens is it's such a strong talking point for politicians to say that they're tough on crime and want to expedite the process um, that they end up, like I said, they tinker with it to the point where they kind of tie it in knots. I am very aware of the impact 20, 20 years worth of appeals have on victims' families. And I am not insensitive to that. And I probably understand that better than most. But I've been a part of seven teams that have walked seven guys off death row some that had been under death warrants at some point in their post-conviction proceedings. Had those appellate remedies not been available, we would have executed innocent people. Wow. That is uh, very sobering and also super scary at the same time. Everyone knows my fear about prison. Well, it's exponentially worse if there's a death warrant out for me. I hope that does not ever happen. Tim Jansen. Uh, from True Lifestyles, uh, who we like, and as a friend of the show, we love everyone here at mm -hmm. STS. Question, uh, Mario, this is the husband. And KCL, you know, I was trying to figure this out. Are they are they still married? Because she took off to Washington State. The story gets complicated, just like the Adelson story. Um, so, KCL, let me know about that. Um, but Mario, the, the husband of Shanna Gardner, has asked for a new prosecution team because of email leaks between his lawyers. Does he have grounds to stand on? Thanks for covering the case. What's your initial reaction? I don't know how much you know you know about that. I'm just familiarizing myself now uh, with this case, but we're going to dig deep into this, and we're going to be uh, up there for this trial come April. But go ahead, Tim. Yeah, they they actually took some some I think computers and phones. And they were supposed to have a taint team, meaning that a person looking at it should not be on the team in case they come across attorney-client information. Apparently, they did come across attorney-client information. And then they were going to go back. And then when they gave the discovery, apparently there's still some attorney-client information. It's, it's not enough to um, get the prosecutors removed. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but there are the, the judge is going to inquire why they did it. And they're going to have to prove that none of that information is admissible in trial. The damage is already done though. You know, if the, if the state knows or hears attorney client conversations, you can't unring the bell. They're going to know what they're talking about. They're going to know what they're saying and how they're preparing 
it's it, it defeats the whole purpose of the attorney client privilege. The state should have done a lot better job. I don't know who made who dropped the ball on that. Um, but that, that's a major faux pas. Anytime they get attorney client communications, that's really, really bad. The judge is not, unless it's going to be purposeful, kick them off the uh, case. It's funny, Joel, because if this case would have gone to St. Augustine, St. John's County, mm -hmm. penalty chances would have gone up 80%. Really? St. John's County is probably one of the most conservative counties in the state of Florida. Wow. I mean, it's like, my understanding is like 92% Republican. Wow. And um, so, and, and he was going to St. John's County because that's where the new wife lived, but he didn't make it. He, he was still in Jacksonville Beach or in, in Duval County, which has the worst, absolute worst jail I've ever been to in downtown Jacksonville. Wow. Well, that's, that, that's where Shanna Gardner is right now, along with Mario Fernandez and a guy named Henry Tennant, who we're going to get to in a minute. Uh, again, a lot to unpack here, and I have Tim and Monica on for their expertise. Uh, Monica knows death penalty cases like no one else. So uh, as they're kind of giving us their color on all this, I'm going to give you some details about this. When uh, this guy, Henry Tenen was arrested, he is the alleged or accused trigger man here. Uh, Kirsten Bride, again, told the local Jackson station, this is now the widow, and I'm quoting, it's pretty clear that someone knew his route, his schedule. I have felt since the beginning that this was planned. This was thought out and this was specific to Jared. So I'm not surprised that they announced that Henry Tenen, someone that we had never heard of, that Jared did not know was not alone in this. Again, you go back to Dan Markell, Sigfredo Garcia, Luis Rivera. He had no idea. Uh, who those guys were. Dan Markell had not a clue, but he did know Charlie Adelson and Donna Adelson, who are now both behind bars. Um, Monica, Sarah, uh, ski hat, Sarah with the ski hat back on. Would they try for the death penalty with the hopes of getting a life, assuming it will be difficult to sentence her to death? Is there some kind of bigger strategy here by seeking the death penalty, um, you know, outside of just the death penalty itself? They want, they, Listen, they don't, that circuit, I find, they don't play games with the death penalty. Mm -hmm. In the second judicial circuit, uh, where here in Tallahassee, historically, there had been a, not a policy, but certainly a practice where they would seek death if you were hit by a bus, <laughs> because it would force you to waive you would, in order to get the government to waive seeking death against your client, they would ask you to waive 12 jurors. Yeah. So it would be a 612 waiver. So you would do anything. If you've been doing this work long enough, you will do anything to avoid having to go to trial with the death penalty hanging over your head. Sometimes there's just no choice and you just got to tee it up and, you know, fight. But if you, if you have a way to save your client's life and avoid a death sentence, you figure out a way to do it. So here, and that may be what they're doing in this case. They That may be a new practice they have over there. They all go to these state attorney conferences and, mm -hmm. you know, compare notes on what works and how to, you know, really stick it to the defense. And and that's fine. We we do the same at our defense conferences. So, I mean, that's, that's just, you know, strategizing. But they could be seeking death in an effort to get her to waive 12 jurors and then, and then they'll waive death. Um, th they also may feel like she deserves death and they may also feel like they can really get the death penalty. I don't know. Mm. Um, Doris has a comment here. Sh Shanna has been spiteful in the past toward her ex. She couldn't get over Jared being able to move on and be happy without her. She falsely accused Jared and lost. She's a spoiled girl. Uh, there are accusations or you know, there was word out there that she may have had an affair at one point. Obviously, the marriage was on uh, very shaky legs. Tim, this is fascinating to me because not only geographically is it close to you guys in Tallahassee, uh, but it's so weirdly similar to the Adelson and Dan mm -hmm. Markell case. Do um, you see it that way? Like, what are the biggest in your in your eyes? What are the biggest sort of commonalities here? Well, you have. A very affluent family. Apparently, Shanna's family is very affluent from some stamp business. Uh, gets divorced, had kids involved. 
she did she gets a new boyfriend she hires somebody that's the allegation to kill her ex-spouse um you got a hired hitman um then the husband is executed and in this case you know it's it's just it's so sad that that little two-year-old was in that car seat the mother I think he just dropped the twins off at the XY's house. So she would have known what road he was traveling, when he was traveling. That information could have been passed on to uh, Mario and then passed on to Tenen. He would have that tire in the street and then just to execute him like that. And he didn't have a chance. And the child, apparently he was there for 25 minutes in the road before another car came by and that child had to, it, you, your heart breaks for these people. I have no sympathy if she was involved. Um, it is problematic that they gave the deal they gave to Tenen. Um, he's 61 years old. Uh, they tried to break him. They really did. They had him in that room under the guise of a, a habitual traffic offender. Two hours, it wasn't getting anywhere. And then they turned the camera off and they showed him all the evidence they had against him. And then he asked for a lawyer. And then, then apparently the next day they arrest Mario and he must have done a proffer and he's getting 15 to life. Um, the question is, and this happened in the Winchester case, there wouldn't have been a tenon if there wasn't a Mario and a Shanna, right? right. There wouldn't have been. You knew the how, now you know the why. Um, and people, I don't want to give a deal to the shooter. Well, sometimes you got to give a deal to that shooter to get to the person who caused this whole thing to happen. And it smells, it stinks. And I'm sure the state attorney decided it was worth it because she orchestrated it and we want to make her pay. So that's how you live with it. It's going to be a part of the cross-examination. Baez is going to be able to say, you're only looking at 15 to life. And my client's looking at the death penalty and you shot and killed the guy. You admitted you shot and killed the guy. He's going to play on that, and uh, there's going to be some jurors that aren't going to like that. Um, Monica, to you uh, from Olive Heatley, she's another spoiled princess like Wendy Adelson. So same question to you. Then Jilly Bean says she was unfaithful to Jared. Again, allegation she was cheating on him. Uh, and then she met the new husband at a CrossFit where he was a maintenance guy, and we're going to get into that in a moment too. By the way, um, this is Kirsten bride again the widow now speaking about shanna who's the accused mastermind of this and she says about shanna i've never found shanna to be a truthful person so i don't put a lot of weight into what she said this is prior to the arrest i believe but i'm glad that she's on camera this is definitely prior to the arrest uh she was interviewed and we'll have that for you tomorrow night but i'm glad that she's on camera stating some things the fact that she seems to be trying to be emotional there's no tears there's no real emotion there. Doesn't come across as genuine to me. Uh, before I forget, tomorrow night, by the way, we're going to have psychologists on to sort of analyze the similarities and dissimilarities between the Adelson behavior and uh, the Shanna Gardner and her husband's behavior and how they acted and dealt in all of this. So we're going to have some psychologists, including Dr. G Explains, Dr. Raj is going to be back, and uh, another name or two. Uh, we are working on and prior, that's 7 p.m. Eastern tomorrow night, 5 p.m. Eastern tomorrow night. We have I never say this, but I will now because she's she's done some interviews, but has not and doesn't plan to do many is Rachel Morin's mother, Patty Morin. She, of course, uh, Rachel Morin is the mom of five murdered on that Mon Pa trail mm -hmm. in Maryland. So if you guys can show your support for her, she's coming on with the geo profiler. Doug McGregor and her son, Nate Moore. And that's going to be tomorrow live at five and then live at seven. We're going to analyze all this from a psychological standpoint. Monica, same question, getting back to you about that. What, um, and someone says Shanna is just like Corey, but Shanna Gardner comes from a lot of money. Corey Richens did not. She was working at home Depot when she met her uh, husband Eric Rich and she's accused of poisoning him with five times the lethal do lethal dose of fentanyl. No shortness of uh, violence and craziness in this country, Monica Jordan. But Monica, what stands out to you as being kind of most similar between the Dan Markell Adelson story and this story? 
white, rich, elitist, conspiring with people that have nothing to lose. If you're going to have an affair or you're going to conspire to kill somebody, you should probably do it with somebody that um, has as much to lose or more than you. If you're screwing the, I don't know, truck stop, I don't, you know, waitress or whatever, and you've got a socialite wife at home, obviously the lesser of the two has, it has you, owns you. So when you, when you hire or conspire with a drug addict or a gang member or somebody that is of less means and is desperate to pull the trigger, they're going to turn on you. I, you know, for all of the wealth and education that we see with the Shanna Gardners and the Charlie Adelsons, it's like these are the stupidest damn people I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and the common theme is they take advantage of people of color and of our lower socioeconomic means or education. That's the theme I see, and I think it's gross. I would have to agree with you. Uh, in that way, very similar. Uh, this was... Um a marginalized black man, uh, Henry Tenen, without a lot of means. He was actually renting a property from Shannon Gardner's husband. And we'll get into that in a second. First, a question having nothing to do with this, but I'm interested too. from Jam and Monica was Eileen Warnos as scary as she looked. Looks scary uh, as hell. When, when I worked on her case, it was in the post conviction proceedings mm. prior to her being executed. Uh, I will tell you this. She was so extremely mentally ill that the fact that any state doctor said she was competent to waive her appellate rights should have been executed with her. And any doctor that said she was competent should be just have his license pulled. And, and yes, she was scary because she was batshit crazy. She looked but I liked her. You think of the movie? I assume you saw Monster. Yeah, sure. I didn't watch that. I lived it. I don't. I don't. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. I don't typically watch anything that capitalizes on mm. the most horrific thing that happened to my client or to a victim's family. Well, then I won't suggest that you watch it on Netflix tonight. Um, <laughs> Tim Jansen, uh, side Barbie, not to be confused confused with side bar. Uh, uh -huh. Jared's <laughs> kids are with Shanna's parents. Sound familiar? Again, yep. this is crazy. Uh, in fairness, though, it sounds to me, and again, I'm just starting to dig in on the story, uh, that Shanna Gardner's parents who live, um, I want to say, in uh, the Salt Lake area are, you know, I think they're devout Mormons. Um, they, On the surface, they seem like okay people. I could be wrong. But, Tim, uh, it is an interesting parallel, is it not? It is. It's really sad. Um, what money does to people, you don't want to blame the grandparents. Um, oh, I do blame Donna because Donna has a lot of guilt, but I don't know what this, her, Shanna's family knew about what she was doing. I know that they sold their beach house or something in Florida for like 3.6 million and they moved to Washington. Um, and I don't, I don't know what they do. What do you do when you want to be near your grandkids? They're Mormons. Um, but I'm sure they put up the money to hire Jose Baez and these other and this other team. Um, I'm, not, I'm not so sure how Baez is going to do um, because I originally did not think he was going to win the Casey Anthony case. I thought that jury was just completely messed up. Um, I don't know if it was jury selection. Um, and I, I was shocked at the verdict, to tell you the truth, and many people were. I think everybody deep down knew that she had something to do with the death of her daughter. I think people still believe that. Um, but, you know, you get a jury and you got to get someone in there and he's, the, the state probably wasn't ready for his defense, what he was going to do. He wasn't a well-known name, and I don't think they really knew much about him trying cases. And I think he just shocked them and surprised them. And he used that case, to, and now he's apparently, I don't know what his fee is, but getting a big fee on this case. Um, but no, not every lawyer wins every case. You can win good cases, and you're going to lose good cases too. Tim, what's a guy like Jose Baez with the name that he has and with Casey Anthony, what's a guy like him get paid for a defense like this? 
Uh, I'm I'm get it. I'm guessing with that family with money, he probably told them I need a million dollar retainer. Wow. Um, and that would be separate for the other lawyers. He's going to take a million dollars because he can. And you got a family desperate with a lot of money and their daughter's on the line and they're going to pay it. Wow. And, be, and, yeah. And will, will this be all that he works on between now and April? No, not at all. He's got other cases. Wow. Uh, this case probably won't even go in April. Lonnie can tell you death penalty cases. It's not you know, there's it's not no way it'll go in April. There's, there's no way it can go in April. They're, they, they haven't even. Mario's lawyers just filed, you know, in June, a motion for a bill of particulars. They just right. filed their notice of death penalty qualifications. He's Mr. Bias is just now compiling his team. Um, it, she's just been arrested. So, I mean, it's going to take I don't even know if they have a mitigation specialist. Just I have a pretty good idea who they'll use. <clears throat> and um, and they've brought in these other lawyers, but there's no way you can be ready by April. If they go in April on a death penalty case and she gets death, that's ineffective. Gonna get, that's ineffective assistance of counsel. I mean, you mm. can't even get an expert to evaluate her for any mm. you know potential mitigation. You know any of the mitigating factors. You know people are booked out through the December of next year. Experts. You know we got to get them in there. You got to get them. Hired. I mean, they could. They may be able to fast track it because it's a privately retained case. But this goes back, you know, when we were talking about Luis Rivera. When I got brought in on that case, why I was having an absolute, uh, you know, heart attack because I they were pushing pushing the state saying we're going to move for a speedy trial, and I was like, holy shit, we don't even have all. I don't even have all the discovery. You know, this is a death penalty case. Obviously, they were they were smart and they're far better poker players than me. And it worked out in his defense. But I was literally, you know, panicked. You know, Joel and, and judges on a death penalty case, they're going to they're going to give every continuance, anything that can possibly require continuance. They're going to do because it's going to be looked at. It's going to be scrutinized. Jose is not a death quality qualified lawyer. Uh, I'm not death qualified and I've gotten cases where I had to bring in death qualified lawyers. You can waive it. Um, and it's not easy. And death qualified cases are limited to usually lawyers that work second chair or death quality cases and they build up where they get the qualifications. But the death qualifications really are they want to make sure you understand there's two phases. You understand there's a mitigation phase as well as there is the guilt phase. And then, like Monica says, you got mitigation. Then you got to pick, be able to pick a death qualified jury. That's completely different than picking a regular jury. You're looking about, so, and and that's got specialty laws on it, also. Um, so you don't see a lot of death penalty qualified lawyers. And quite frankly, Joel, there's not a lot of money to be made in death quality qualified cases because these offenses they usually have bad criminal histories, or the cases are so bad, so heinous that you're not going to make money. It's not the bread and butter, um, you know, like like F. Lee Bailey did the Sam Shepard case. That wasn't a death qualified case. That mm -hmm. was a wealthy doctor, you know. Yeah. Yeah. People kill people. That's where the money's made, and they're not death qualified cases. Money makes the world go around, sadly. If I could, uh, if I could just say, in, in 30 years of doing death penalty work, um, I've only had two privately retained death penalty cases. Everything else has been court appointed typically. Um, and I will say this. A lot of people are like, oh, public defenders, blah, blah. They're public pretenders. Blah. Those are the guys that are in the trenches every day and they have the resources. Uh, you know, a lot of times people like maybe this lady's family, maybe the Adelsons have the kind of money to finance a, a, a big swing and team like this. But usually you want the public defender or a court appointed counsel so you can use the government's resources and then you can have all the goody, all the experts, all the forensic testing, all the geo mapping, everything. Um, so I, I sometimes I get a little frustrated when people say, oh, I want a real lawyer. I don't want a public defender. And it's like, well, be careful what you wish for. Because mm -hmm. they can throw a million dollars at Mr. Baez and, and Patrick Carity and, and Mr. Ron Sullivan out of Harvard. Yeah. 
They who, can, Monica, who are those guys? Most people have no idea of those names. So who are they? Ron Sullivan's a guy that just came in pro hoc vici on her case. He's a Harvard uh, academia that does a lot of social social justice and some death penalty work, it appears. I don't know him personally. Patrick Carity is a lawyer out of um, Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. The reason why I think Jose Baez was brilliant in putting this team together is Mr. Baez is from Orlando or Central Florida, maybe Miami. I don't know. He's not from Jacksonville. He brought in a local guy. Patrick Carity is a local guy. And I, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing his last name right. But he's a military guy. He has a ton of military experience. And he, Jacksonville, Duval County is a military town. So you're bound to have some kind of military person on the jury or in the jury panel. So why not have... A, a military lawyer who knows the locals. Right. This is where I think all of these rich elitist white defendants in the Adelson case <laughs> went, went, went wrong. You hire a bunch of silk stocking, white collar criminal defense lawyers from Miami. You <coughs> hire some big con jury consulting group out of New York yep. to pick a jury in Tallahassee, Florida. Are you high? Like what, why that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. They could have spent $1,500, $5,000 to hire a local defense attorney, not even a good one, maybe just anybody that does defense work to sit at them at the table and at least tell them in the jury pool, Hey, this person's from the South side. This person's from the North side. This person's from the West side. This person's from the East side. Just give them a little lay of the land. Yeah. But, but what Rashbaum done did with that jury consultant and and coming up here and picking a jury with no help was, I promise you, you will see it on the appeal. Three point eight five zero. This will could be an ineffective assistance of counsel. Absolutely, sure. you you will see that. Sure. Wow, sure. um, it, it just goes to show you that rich people aren't always smart. I mean, just I, I can't get over the fact that Don and Harvey bought a one way ticket. I mean, just complete a completely idiotic move. I mean, ridiculously stupid. Uh, by the way, well, the stupid uh, thing was they didn't leave the day before the verdict came back on Adelson. Had he been acquitted, they could have flown their asses back. Your even better point, Monica, even a better point right there. That's why I got Monica Jordan on the show. Jerry Michael, um, how does an attorney, Tim, become death case certified? But look at this. KCL knows this case inside wow. out. Shanna's parents make 100 million dollars per year that's probably the company i don't know what they take home but it's a lot wow. and uh, I, I, think, I think jose got a lot more than one million dollars if yeah. they make a hundred million yeah. I, I don't know what the hell stamping up is I mean, i've never heard of this in my life people are making hundreds of millions of dollars never heard of stamping up in my life but um tim jansen how do you become death penalty qualified what does what, that what involve? happens is um like Monica said, the public defenders get a lot of bad publicity. And, and I think they really focus it on the younger lawyers and the misdemeanor divisions, lower levels, because they got so many cases and, and they don't have the time. The people doing death penalty and the public defender, those people know everything about the law. They got the experience and they have the resources. Monica and I have a first degree murder case and we are, our clients indigent, we are able to get the state to pay for our experts because no private pay client could afford to spend 50, 75, $100,000 to, to do a defense in these cases. Um, so what happens is they'll, they'll bring second chair, and Monica can tell me if I'm wrong, they'll have a second chair person sit with a deaf qualified, and they'll do certain amount of trials. And when they get enough trials, and then the judge certifies it, and the lawyers certify, then they can become deaf qualified, but they gotta take courses, they got to take exams uh, to be death qualified. And, it, and they should, because it's the ultimate taking of your liberty is your life by the state of Florida. You want the most experienced lawyers handling those cases. And as Monica said, you know, eyewitness testimony was so bad for years that when DNA became so apparent, almost all those people taken off death row were based on eyewitness testimony alone which goes to show you how flawed eyewitness testimony is. And you can see these examples, and I've seen them. You're in a room, someone runs by with a gun, and then runs across. And then you interview the people, and you'll be shocked at the, the descriptions. You'll be shocked at the guns. You, you won't believe eyewitness testimony is so poor. 
Mm-hmm. It really is. That's interesting. Black Widow is also interesting, coming to us from the Republic of Ireland. Uh, by the way, thanks for your sweet note, Black Widow. Um, I plan to respond. Uh, I think I'm okay. She was concerned about my uh, about my mental health yesterday. I had Carm on the show, and uh, things were dicey. Uh, do they think of the kids at all before they do these crimes? The short answer is we're going to have psychologists on tomorrow night. We're going to discuss all sorts of uh, these types of issues. True lifestyles. Shanna had an affair with her trainer at the gym, and Mario worked there too, according to Jacksonville sources. A lot of uh, a lot of salacious stuff going on there. And uh, look at this. Love this channel and its guests truly are amazing. Thank you for your dedication, hard work. That's why we say best guests. It's not just a tagline. It's a way of life. And I always say best guests, better community. So here's the quote moving through here. We're weaving in uh, the facts of the story with uh, analysis from Tim and Monica. So Kirsten Bride again, and thank you, KCL, for that pronunciation. Uh, She is now quoted. Someone asked me when Shanna was arrested. She was just arrested this past August. So it's only been a few months. So this is all very new and recent. And she said for 547 days, we hoped and prayed. This is now the widow that this day would come from very, very early on. Everything in my body and soul told me she was behind it. Meaning Shanna Gardner as for the twins, Abby and Liam, she said they had been kept away and isolated from us. Does that sound familiar? Being kept away from the biological uh, parent here, from the mother in this case, uh, while living with their mother, uh, uh, gardener, stepfather, and maternal grandparents who are making $100 million a year. Shanna Gardner, just so you know, um, at the time of the murder, I believe was 35 years old, and she drew immediate scrutiny Uh, She did not attend the funeral, and uh, the couple was divorced back in 2015. Uh, This happened back in 2022. So, Monica, I'm just curious about this. Let's say you're handed, let's just hypothetically say Jose Baez calls you tomorrow and says, we need a PI on this case. Where do you start? What do you do? For penalty phase or for guilt innocence phase? I mean, for penalty phase, I'm going to start doing a social history sit down with her and start finding out everything we know about her to show that she's a decent human being. And she marries the maintenance guy, nothing against maintenance guys. Please don't start, you know, that's the maintenance guy. Um, My point is, is that she goes from living this very uh, privileged life and then kind of go takes, it goes in a different direction. Kind of looks like the COE's ex-boyfriend. Go on. I'm sorry. Right. So, right. Right, right. It's like all of our ex-boyfriends. And so what I find interesting is like, is there a component there, a psychological component there that is she under some kind of duress? Is she is she using drugs? Has she lost her damn mind? Um, There's things going on in her life where she gets to the point where she has if she's involved, she's had some kind of break to where she gets sucked into wanting to be a part of killing this guy. You know, how do you not go to the funeral of the father of your children? I mean, you may think he's the biggest SOB in the world and maybe prayed for him to die. You may have been a part of him dying. I don't know. But how do you not go to the funeral with your children to their father's funeral? I mean, Tim Tim has a very good... um, he, he did a case I did with him, the Brian Winchester case and the Denise Williams. Denise didn't plot that murder, but she knew about it and just kind of was siloed off. That could be the case here. I don't know. But those are the immediate things that I would want to know to start developing the theme of the mitigation. Is she a battered woman? Is she chemically imbalanced? Does she have a mental health component? Is she... Uh, you know, is she under the duress of this guy? These are all mitigators that would be, I mean, she's not a low functioning, uneducated, you know, lacking, you know, lacking life skills that she can't live independently. That That's not the type of mitigation that I'm talking about, but I'm talking about true PTSD, mental health components, battered woman syndrome. Was she under the, you know, 
the duress or the the dominance of this husband. I mean, he, this this scenario looks very bizarre to me. Look from the outside looking in. I, I'm almost wondering now, did she marry this guy because he may have been of of a a, a mindset that she could use him later? That's I mean, was she setting this poor bastard up? That, that's interesting. So that, that I mean, that's an interesting angle that that you would be looking at, no doubt. Um, certainly this guy, Henry Tennant, the trigger man, the accused trigger man uh, who's sitting in jail. Uh, obviously, so, someone else set it up here. Basically, rich white people having, you know, poor minorities do their bidding for them. Something yeah, along those lines. Uh, KCL here says there are major custody battles over the twins, even still. The gardener, Shanna's parents, currently have custody of the twins. They patently lied on the court paperwork to obtain custody per Fox. Um, and I'll tell Doesn't you that what. Sound familiar. Doesn't that sound familiar? It's amazing, the, the similarities here. Then someone else just uh, hammering the point home here, stamping the point home. The family is ridiculously wealthy. They own a huge multi-level marketing stamp craft business in Utah. Uh, I have no idea what that means. Dom's mom, Gifton Five. Surviving the Survivor memberships. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, How just, old are the twins? The twins were two at the time. Um, they're probably like around four now. KCL would no, the, no, the baby. Oh, the older two. twins. Um, I think they were. I want to say they were nine at the time, nine. so probably eleven. Nine. They're like yeah. twelve. Like so, yeah. they're like 12, 11, right? 12, which is crazy because the that's middle school. And the Markel kids are 13, 14. 14 so, yeah, yeah, it's these kids are old enough they know. to know what's going That's on. Horrible. I mean, it's, it's, That's it's horrible. That's horrible. The only saving grace or silver lining, if there is one, is that two-year-old obviously will not yeah, remember sitting in that yeah. car, which, you know, thankfully. But um, just to fill in some more of the uh, holes here. So, again, Jared Bridegan and Shanna Gardner, they were married in 2010 divorced in 2015. Uh, she marries her second husband, this guy, Mario Fernandez Saldana, that Monica is now questioning if she married to use him. Uh, she marries him in 2018, and they start a baking company, because you can do that when your parents are worth $100 million, called Beach Baked 904. Mm -hmm. um, and she's quoted in the newspaper after his death as saying, this is now Shanna, the one accused of the murder. This is her saying... I feel for Jared's family and what they are going through. I can't even imagine. I have tried to be respectful. I have tried to give them space. Uh, amazing if she is, in fact, convicted of this crime. Uh, the murder itself happens on February 16th, 2022. So this February will be exactly two years. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll get into some of the details of that. But Tim Jansen, same question to you. Let's say hypothetically you are Jose Baez. You get a call mm -hmm. from Shanna Bride, Shanna Bridegan, um, Shanna Gardner, sorry, formerly Bridegan, and you get a call from Shanna. What are you? Where do you start with this, Tim? From well, your perspective, you're going to have an investigator looking at Tenon's background, looking at the plea deal he got. Then you're going to find out Mario. Who's Mario's lawyer? Is he cutting a deal? What's his criminal history look like? Um, I don't know if they, I guess they're going to have to look at the phones. Um, I don't think she would ask for a speedy trial. That'd be kind of crazy. Uh, although Monica and I've seen it done here, uh, not in death penalty cases. We've seen it done in, in first degree murder cases. And sometimes it works out and sometimes it's really bad. Um, thinking the state's not going to be ready. Uh, but there's a lot to, to go on. I don't know if they're still married. Are they? Are Mario and Shanna still married? Because I believe they are. Uh, KCL, I missed that from you because I think they're separated. I believe she was out there in Washington with her family. I think she just took off. I'm not 100% yeah. sure. She's I've got to be honest. She left him. She left him to face this by himself. She, she, right. She ditched him and, it was and went every to Washington. Man for himself. Right. She went to Washington State. Yeah. I mean, that tells you. They're going to cut a deal with him. The state is going to cut a deal with Mario for sure. Because he, he'll be the link between Tenon. Tenon doesn't have a link probably to Shannon. So they're going to need that link, just like Mag Bonawa got. You know, yeah. they had to bring her yeah, in. Tenon's link, you're right, is to Mario Fernandez Soldana. Right. But let me ask you this, Tim. 
Take us inside baseball here. When you say right now that the state's going to cut a deal with this Mario Fernandez Saldana, well, how does that work? They, they go into a room one day, and what do they say? I can tell you how it's done because I can tell you how it happened in the Brian Winchester case. Okay. In all my cases in 30 years, the prosecutor said there's no plea deal. I'm like, what do you mean no plea deal? No plea deal. It's a, it was a kidnapping and a battery. and I mean, they normally have plea deals. No, no plea deal. Well, what do you mean? Well, you know, maybe maybe your client remembers something happened. I'm like, happened what? Well, you know, maybe something happened like 19, 20 years ago. Well, I don't know what you're talking about at the time, you know. And eventually one thing leads to another. Then my client did some stupid crap while he was in prison. And then we decided, well, maybe we should sit down with the state and maybe we should do what's called a proffer. And they said, okay. And then the senior prosecutor let the junior prosecutor send me a proffer agreement. And I said, well, I don't really like that proffer agreement. He goes, oh, go ahead and make whatever changes you want. So we spent like two weeks building the most ironclad proffer that turned into the most ironclad immunity agreement that I couldn't believe they signed. They signed it. We went into the room. And it was the first time anybody had ever heard how Mike Williams was executed by my client. And my guy had basically full immunity because he had derivative use immunity, which meant, in essence, once we showed him the body, which we did, took him to the site, they could never introduce the body. And if you can't introduce the body, you can't charge somebody with murder because you can't say he was murdered without the body. So, in effect, the agreement. Mike uh, Brian Winchester could never be prosecuted, and that's why they cut that deal. They did. They didn't know the deal they were cutting, but then they lived with it because they got the wife who was the impetus behind it. Uh, KCL with more valuable information here. Yes, Joel, the Gardeners are LDS Latter Day Saints. They live in a suburb south of Salt Lake City, and they are terrible enablers. Sounds like. Someone whose name rhymes with Shauna, almost. Donna. Shauna and Donna. That's kind of interesting. I just made that up on the fly, but it is true. <laughs> I'm a poet, and I didn't even know it. It is reported that... <laughs> anyway, it's reported that the gardeners are renting an Airbnb on Jacksonville Beach after they sold their beach house. It doesn't sound like uh, money is much of an option Uh to them by the way this thing that i lean on every night i think <laughs> one day very soon is going to snap off because it's made from like ikea and uh not going to blame the coe but i think there could be one loose screw intentionally there so i go flying uh, during a show we'll see if that happens in the near future um talking there's some stuff here about the winchester case so the uh the arrests here so the arrests come um, the first two arrest is this guy, Henry Tennant. And someone pointed out in the chat, and I think it's a good point that, yes, you can say that they're being used by rich white people. But at the end of the day, everyone does have their choice. And this guy did um, reportedly commit murder. He has not been convicted yet, but everything's he pled. No, he entered a plea. Well, right. he pled guilty. He right. entered a plea. Thank you for the correction, Timbo. So he pled guilty. And the other one, Mario uh, Fernandez, um, obviously has to be uh, tried here, but they are accused the first two arrests on charges. They're charged with conspiracy to commit murder, second degree murder with a weapon and accessory after the fact to a capital felony and uh, child abuse. Uh, again, Tenen did plead guilty and agreed to testify. But what about these charges, Tim Jansen, conspiracy to commit murder, second degree murder with a weapon accessory after the fact to a capital felony and child abuse. How does that compare, let's say, to the charges against Donna and Charlie? Well, accessory means you you helped after the murder. Conspiracy is the same charge to the murder. Second degree murder, I guess they're, they're saying they didn't plan it, not premeditated. I doubt that's not true. Someone had to tell Tenen where to put the tire. Someone had to tell him when to be there. Um Accessory after the fact is it's a very serious crime to capital offense. Um, you could spend 30 years in prison for that also. Um, remember, we had a 
case here, Monica, where this girl, all she did was help carry the body to the car. She went on a speedy trial. They offered her immunity. Her lawyer decided to go for a speedy trial and she was convicted and got sentenced to life in prison because she just carried the body out. You know the case I'm talking about, right, Monica? Yes. And I don't know if you were working on that case, but um, some, I mean, you know, capital offenses are serious offenses. If you do obstruction afterwards, you commit perjury in a capital offense. You're going to prison for a long, long time. Um, murder is a is the worst offense you can have in the state of Florida. And state of Florida is very serious about their death penalty. They always have been. They've always wanted it. Um, it's been it's been a fixture in the state of Florida. Probably what the second most death besides Texas, maybe Monica. Is that right? Yes. Um, so they're serious about murder here. Unfortunately, we have too many murders in Florida. We have too many shootings in Tallahassee. It's like a daily occurrence now. Yeah. Um, and they're this shooting. Whole, all over this the whole country is just racked with violence. It just never, ever ends. I, I don't know what it is. Um, Barb 417, I'm going to toss this to Monica. Uh, Mark Seavers of Florida sits on death row for the murder of his wife. He did not use the hammer to kill her. What's the difference between him, Adelson, and Gardner? I'm not familiar with that case. So, and when when Barb says he did not use the hammer to kill her, I'm assuming the hammer was the murder weapon that they alleged in that case. I, I don't know. I don't know the differences between Adelson and Gardner. I think just regarding the difference between Adelson and Gardner, not Mr. Yeah. Seavers, is that Wendy claims she didn't know about any of this. Uh, I predict Shanna's probably going to do the same thing. Shauna, Shanna, whatever. But th there's more of a direct link because it's Shanna's husband's associate, tenant, that pulled the trigger. Um, so there's a direct link between, just like there was a direct link between Charlie to Katie, Katie to Sigfrido, there's a direct link between uh, the husband, Mar Mario, to, to Henry Tennant. And by the way, KCL here. Yes, Henry Tennant took a plea deal. I think he got 17 years in exchange for his testimony against Shannon and Mario. He is 60, 63, so that is pretty much a life sentence for him. I was stunned to find out that the life, uh, life expectancy for a black man in South Carolina, not in Florida, is something like 63 or 64 years old. And for a white male, it's like 72. Uh, that is Henry Tennant. This is the uh, the the shooter in the case, the man who pled guilty, pleaded guilty, uh, cut a deal with the state. This is him, uh, sort of a career criminal and uh, have some information on him that uh, we can go over. Um, Tim. I'm just curious here. Um, we talked about the, the similarities between the Adelsons mm -hmm. in this case, but what about some of the big differences that you see? Um, the big differences. Um, well, the link here is a lot more direct, and these people were a little more dumb. Mario uh, Tenon was renting from Mario. You don't have much of a chain link separation between them. Um, it's clear that the murder was set up by the timing, dropping off the kids and then going down the one way road. Clearly they knew and it was set in stone. It was going to be, it's going to happen. Um, the finances are the same. The wife not going to the funeral, who knows? Maybe she wasn't invited. Maybe the family said, stay away. We don't want you there. We think you're involved, you murderer. So she didn't go. Um, because the Adelsons did go to the funeral, right? And um, that was probably more heartache for the family of Markel, seeing them there. Uh, we know Ruth talked about what happened after the funeral, how, how devastated she was and how that whole thing occurred. Um, these people are just not normal. Uh, what they do is not what real people do. Um, there's no coincidences in life in murder cases. Things happen for a reason. 
And if it ties to the murder, it's not a coincidence. It's a read. It's a fact. And mm. people are stupid. They think they can get away with murder. Technology has improved. Um, phones track people where they go, what they do, and cameras track people. And so Tennant's car, they tracked his car all over Jacksonville with license plate readers. And that's what they were interviewing him, trying to get him to flip before they showed him evidence. And he didn't flip. Um, but 17 years to a guy 63, it might be a life sentence. You know, it might be, but it's not the same as giving a life sentence. And that's what the family of the victims want, a life sentence, knowing that you did what you did. And getting more information on the Mark Seavers thing uh, from Monica and myself, that he had his best friend kill his wife. I guess the implication was that basically hired a, a hired gun or a hammer man uh, in that case. Um, there's a photo, Henry Tennant, by the way, uh, this is the information I was going to get to. He had had nine arrests in Jacksonville, all on minor offenses, according to jail records prior to this. Um, at the time of his arrest, he was actually in jail awaiting trial uh, on charges of possession of a weapon and, uh, by a felon and driving with a suspended or revoked license and a third or subsequent conviction. Tim, how big a deal is that? Charges of possession of a weapon by a felon and driving with a suspended or revoked license on a third or subsequent conviction? Big well, deal or a firearm by a convicted felon. He's going to do three years in the state prison. A habitual offender, which they were going to go after him, he would have gotten prison time. Um, and it, it's clear. I mean, if you watch the interview, I watched his interview briefly. This guy was a street savvy guy. He was sitting there listening to what they were saying and they were talking and he wasn't falling for it. And then when they showed him what they really were there for, he calmly said, you know what? I think I need an attorney. This is a guy that's been in the system. You get a regular guy that's never been in trouble before. And they go in there and they're going to talk themselves and they're going to talk, talk, talk. And they usually end up convicting themselves. But this guy was street savvy. He didn't say anything until he got a lawyer to cut his deal. And it's sad because the guys in the system know the system usually get better deals than the poor guy that makes a mistake one time and goes in and confesses or makes statements and then your ability to get a good deal is or get any deal is not as good because the case against you is pretty strong uh kcl with some more uh, information shanna was not invited to jared's funeral i believe kirsten asked her to stay away and therefore shanna refused to let jared's twins attend jared's mm -hmm. funeral so oh, that's horrible yeah, again, tons of acrimony, not letting the kids go to your own father's funeral. I mean, there's no depths to how low these people go. Kimberly with a super sticker. Uh, Monica, to you. Jose Baez has been riding the coattails of the Casey Anthony win for the last 15 years. Overrated attorney. Your response, Monica. Hope he doesn't call to hire you tomorrow. <laughs> uh, no. She'll answer. She'll answer. <laughs> um, he had a phenomenal team. He had Ann Fennell on that team. He had Rosalie Bolin on that team. They picked a phenomenal jury. Casey Anthony is one of the most hated, probably one of the most hated individuals. Agreed. And that was a horrible, horrible case. But this is what people just general lay people that have good walking around common sense cannot wrap their head around. And that is they could not prove when that baby died. Right. So because she's an asshole, because she's off yucking it up and clubbing it up and has the gravitas to walk the detectives into an office that she doesn't even work at and act like she's taking them to her office. I mean, she is a scumbag liar. No mm -hmm. doubt about it. But they could not put the baby with her when she took her last breath. And that's, that is what I think the jury actually got hung up on. And, and that was a, um, you know, if, if people were convicted of being assholes or liars or whatever, we, listen, there'd be no lawyers walking the streats. I mean, you know, not the liars part. But you Tim, see, I'll saying, allow you to rebut to. Uh, no, but, but, my point, but my point is, is that what, 
a lot of times what people don't understand is that what happens to the body after the murder is as crass and insensitive as this sounds is a non-issue. The fact that she was wrapped up in a blanket and, and decomposed and in the woods, that's horrible, but they could not, they did not know the actual time and cause of death of that child. And that's what, that's what got Casey Anthony over the hurdle of reasonable doubt. And I think a lot of that happens in picking the correct jury. Well, you know, it's more than that, Monica. You know, Jose had to have some presence that he was able to sell the jury that story. Oh, yeah. And oh, for okay, sure. so Jose, this was Jose's biggest case in his life. He was representing her cellmate on drug charges or something. And he somehow convinced her to hire him. And he, he did it. People said he couldn't do it. He got in there and he scrapped. He found a way. She was an evil person. Um, no one thought she would get off. But he somehow was able to get those jurors to vote not guilty. And I agree with you. They couldn't put her in her hands, so they couldn't blame her for the death. I think the jury did what they needed to do, even though we all don't like it. It tastes right. it stinks. Listen, in any trial situation, there there is the showman that sells sells it to the jury, and then there's the brains of the operation behind him. That's right. And Fennell was the brains of that team. And I'm, I'm, you know, they did a very good job. I, you know, that's. I, I think she probably did it. I think she probably did it. And, uh, but I think Mr. Baez danced a really great dance, and the jury bought it. Hey, and listen, he did his job. He was hired to defend his client, and sometimes you have to represent a bad client, right? Um, but you're right. You have to have a good, smart people and you have someone that can sell it to a jury. And he did it. And I commend him for that. Not because I wanted her to get off, but he, he, he had a goal and he reached it and he convinced, I think it was 12 jurors. Was it 12 or six? Was it? They were seeking death. They were seeking death. Oh, it was 12 my jurors. He got 12 jurors to vote not guilty on a death of a little girl. When a jury normally is always going to, someone's going to pay for the death of a little girl. Uh, Tim, Yala says, Jose's defense was her dad sexually assaulted her. Come on, Tim. That is not presence. That is just BS. Your response. I don't disagree with that um, <laughs> at all. Um, you know, I, I, Yala, you're right that she he sexually assaulted her. It's pathetic. Um, but it was the cards he had to sell. And somehow... 12 jurors believed it and the judge let him go with that defense. And if it was so piss poor, why couldn't the state have overcome it? Why couldn't they overcome it with, you know, rebuttal or something? Um, I'm not saying I'm giving him credit because my understanding bias, he won that case, but I'm, I've told people all the time, a bad lawyer can win a good fat case and make them look great. And a great lawyer can have a crappy case factually and make him look bad. Um, and Rosbaum had a crappy case factually. So it didn't make him look that great. This um, is a sound from Shanna Gardner. This is prior to her arrest, the COE working double time. Here we go. Let's listen to this and get uh, the experts take. Um. I fell to the floor because I was devastated um, for what I was going to have to tell my kids. Play that one more time. When she said it was a short was sound bite, she wasn't joking. Um, I fell to the floor because I was devastated um, for what I was going to have to tell my kids. Monica Jordan, you're a mother. Uh, you hear this, uh, crocodile tears. This is prior to her arrest. Uh, what goes through that big, beautiful brain of yours, Monica Jordan? <laughs> I think at the thank you. I think at the time she had Hank Cox as a lawyer because yeah. Hank Cox, Hank Cox, yeah. and he was brilliant. He was the president of the Florida bar. He blah blah yeah. blah, Mister Smart Pants. Hmm. What lawyer lets their client 
Go no. on the news. That's the no. reason number 976 why you don't do that. Because you got reporters like me and I talk I, them into it. Care. What are you talking about? I don't care. The one thing you cannot spin is silence. So now I've got mm. every every person in the world Monday morning quarterbacking what the client looks like when she's giving her Academy Award performance about her her plan. I just think people cannot help themselves to want to be presented and liked and, 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 and presented in the best light. Like I'm the victim. Look at me. I'm, this is so terrible. I fell to the floor and started crying. Maybe she did because maybe like she was like, oh, Jesus, this really happened. So maybe that is a, a genuine reaction. But why in the world would anybody like I tell him all the time, don't, I wouldn't let anybody talk because now they could probably play that clip in her trial. They will. So can I right now. Let's play it again. Lynn, True Lifestyle says <laughs> Shanna equals Wendy. Look, here we go. Um, I fell to the floor because I was devastated um, for what I was going to have to tell my kids. I, I thought she was going to say for what um, I just did. <laughs> I fell to the floor because I was devastated um, for what I was going to have to tell my kids. <laughs> You're right. Wouldn't it that, almost sounds like she, <laughs> I was like, it oh almost, my gosh, she's gonna admit to it. It almost sounds like she is. Um, Tim, what do you, when you watch that and you think, you know, it, it appears in in Wendy Adelson's interrogation that she is actually yep. crying, probably for herself. But what <laughs> what kind of difference or similarity do you see? Because a lot of people are saying so much like Wendy. What do you see here when you're looking at Shannon Gardner? Well, she kind of looks like Wendy. Um, she's believing she can sell this story. She's confident enough that she can get up there, like Monica would say, and had a lawyer and said, oh, I can sell this. I can do this. And I, same with Wendy. Wendy went in there and gave a two hour some interview with the police thinking that she could fend off all their questions. I mean, it just goes to show the arrogance that they can talk their way out of things. And so, Tim, you mentioned this, and then a few more things, and we'll start to wrap up this episode. Uh, evidence against Henry Tannen, the uh, admitted trigger man here. His pickup truck, as you said, uh, was captured on surveillance video. It always happens. But a warrant shows that he received three handwritten checks from Fernandez Saldana. That is the husband of Shanna Gardner. That's back in October 22, and this happens in February 22, so... November, December, January, I have to use my fingers. Four months later, he ends up dead. Um, and Tenen speaks to Mario Fernandez Saldana 35 times uh, in the month that this happens. Uh, how difficult is that for the defense to overcome when they're defending this guy, Mario Fernandez Saldana, that he's also got these three handwritten checks? And again, we go back to the Adelsons. Donna Adelson and the Adelson Institute cutting checks to Katie McBanawa. Um, how big a problem is it? It's a real big problem. I mean, to know the why, you got to know the how, you want to know the why. Someone's paying for this guy. Um, this guy, tenant, a drug dealer, wouldn't have known he's coming down the road. I think the other evidence was outside his house, that place he was renting, they had three tires there. The fourth tire was missing. So it's circumstantial evidence that the fourth tire is the one he put into the road. Um, he certainly, is, I'd love to know how much the checks were for, you know, especially since he was a tenant, he should have been paying Mario, not Mario paying him. Right. Um, yeah, exactly. It's just, <laughs> exactly. It's just, it, you just can't make up this and those kind of things you can't, Monica and I always say that goes into the bad fact column. We need to change the facts. Yeah, um, we change have that. them all the time. And you want you look at your client and we're like, man, our clients are stupid. And we're like, yeah, well, they wouldn't be here if they weren't stupid um, and do stupid things. Um, One of the things that Tim mentioned earlier about, you know, the technology is different. What people don't understand is I think the statistic is you're videoed about 75 times unknowingly in one day, whether it's a, I mean, if you look back at the Adelson case, they were able to get the a camera footage, video footage off the Taltran bus to show the Prius 
next to the bus. And that was a, a, a big factor in how they were able to track Lewis and Siegfriedo. So between all of these license plate readers, you know, in the Murdoch case, uh, the son was sending a Snapchat. You hear Alex Murdoch in the background. It's just a matter of time now because of the technology um, that it's a lot easier for law enforcement to to get leads and follow up on. I mean, you still need good cop work to to run stuff down, but the technology is is people people really just can't get away with anything. And Tim and I like to say all the time, or at least I do, you cannot beat the science. I mean. A video answers a lot of questions. I'm waiting now for the trials where Alexa picks up the crime or confessions or statements, oh. and that's going to be admissible because I'm sorry, people. I know I'm a conspiracy theory, but I can tell you, you talk into that Alexa, people are hearing it. You type something in your phone, you look at something, next thing you know, you've got a hundred ads for that thing you looked up. It is. And those algorithms know what you're looking at and they're counting down what you what you said. That's why um, Carmen will talk and she will not talk near her cell phone. She knows they're listening. Um, Olive Heatley, these are the things we're going to discuss tomorrow with psychologists. How can these evil women. Look at this. She just eliminates my I'm literally reading the comment. The COE just removed it. But uh, we're going to talk about these evil women. Uh, COE, I'm not sure uh, what you just put up there, but I'm about to put this comment up from Philadelphia shoulder surgeon. Try to say that 20 times very quickly. I bet you can't. But I bring this up because I might need her in the future. That's one of the main reasons, selfishly. Uh, Tim, please tell me that you tell your clients that, quote unquote, you're here because you're stupid and you do stupid things. Do you tell your clients that, Tim Jansen? Oh, I have. I have told clients when they go out and drive when they don't have a driver's license or they commit a new offense when they're out on bond. And I say, don't commit a new offense. Or when they come in and tell me a story that's so stupid, I say, listen, if you think I believe your story, why would you want to hire me to represent you? And I think that's the same point I'm trying to make to them. And then they finally, say, oh, okay, well, yeah. Here's what really happened. What really uh, happened? Look, I, don't, I don't want to know what happened. <laughs> This is a I think this is body cam footage, according to COE, I believe, of the arrest of Shanna Gardner. Let's watch this together right now. It's going to be the white vehicle back there. It was a busy day on we'll the road. Pass on your side. Yep. There you have it. Uh, the body cam footage of the arrest of Shanna Gardner. By the way, mommy and daddy, who are, I guess, making $100 million a year. Uh, by the way, mommy and daddy, you can uh, email me, surviving the survivor at Gmail. I take Zelle and Venmo. Um, feel free to donate $50 million to the show. It should get us by for the next year. Um, Monica, what do these people, your clients, tell you behind closed doors when they know that the law is coming for them, when authorities are coming from them, people like your husband who carries handcuffs, when they know that they've done something wrong and they're coming after them, what kind of agony do you think that is? She had to know that at some point she was being arrested. I was going to say mommy and daddy bought a million dollar home in Washington state. That's where she was arrested, not Washington, D.C., but Washington state. But what kind of agony is it for these criminals when they know that they're being hunted down? Well, the, the softest pillow is a clear conscience, mm. um, but they don't have that if they're if they're, you know, involved in this. What what I've done with a lot of lawyers, but specifically with Tim and his partner, Ryan Davis, is that if we are if we are retained 
pre-indictment, pre-charge. Um, we develop a relationship with the government and with law enforcement so that we can self-surrender the client. So it doesn't turn into some media spectacle and, and we can go and turn them in, get them bonded out. And, and we've spent some time explaining, you know, what this process is. Um, she's had a host of lawyers and the fact that none of them kind of secured a resolution as far as a self-surrender or like, Hey, a warrant's coming in this situation. It may have been different because she was of such means. Um, and she had a passport and she could, mm -hmm. you know, flee. So that may be why that worked out that way. But typically in what we like to do is say, Hey, let us self-surrender. It's, it's an officer safety thing. So the client doesn't do something, you know, irrational. Uh, we don't put officers in lives in danger. And also we can kind of manage the expectations. That's one thing. Another thing that we've done in the past, not Tim and I specifically, but a, a brilliant criminal, retired criminal defense lawyer, Clyde Taylor and I, we have allowed the client to testify at the grand jury because that is really your only chance to get a grand jury to not indict you is maybe to, because the, the grand jury is the one that asks the questions, not the you know, the government doesn't have to ask you any questions. So that's another good technique. But in this situation, I wish they would have maybe worked out a deal for her to self-surrender in Florida, because if she was picked up, I, I think you guys said she was picked up in Utah. That's a long, that's a long bus ride. Wa Washington state, Washington state. Even, even further. Even uh, further. <laughs> that's, that's a terrible, that's a terrible way to travel. It's waist chained and handcuffed. Hmm. I mean, Man. Donna, Donna had to do it from Miami. That's eight hours. Washington state. I don't know if they flew her or if they drove her, but either way, that's. How do you terrible. drive someone from Washington state to Jacksonville, Florida? It's a three or four day trip. They stop and they stop and hold them over in facilities. They hold them in like County yeah. jails. Yeah. yeah they, they hold them in County jails. They have a mutual aid agreement with an, a County jail and they'll, the officers will spend the night in a hotel and the inmate will stay in the jail. I'll, I'll tell you what, if that was going to be me, I would like it. It'd be my last uh, cross country trip. Um, and I get to look out the window uh, a little bit real quickly. So, uh, and then we'll start to wrap up after a couple more comments. So the Gardner family is from Salt Lake city. Uh, these two uh, married in Salt Lake city. Um, they met in Florida while, while um, Shanna was visiting uh, someone they met in Florida. They married in 2010 in Salt Lake City. At some point, they moved to Connecticut. Uh, that's where they said they started having trouble with their marriage because she, Shanna, allegedly became involved with a personal trainer. She looks like she's pretty jacked, like she's pretty fit, so she must work out. Um, Shanna Gardner files for divorce uh, February 2015, seeking custody of the twins. Uh, the divorce file... Uh, Tim Jansen has 300 entries and motions. Wow. Um, I know you're not a family attorney, but that seems like a lot. And then it says somewhere along the lines, parents are unable to agree. Uh, the wife, Shanna went on in this about how she was supporting the husband, Jared. He was going to school at the time and that she was the uh, sole uh, provider easy to say when your parents are making a hundred million a year, but uh, Tim, what about that? I mean, this is also obviously a huge similarity with the Adelson case that it comes down to custody. Um, but what about this specifically here uh, about these 300 entries and motions in this divorce file of theirs? That's a lot. That's a lot. And clearly she probably wanted, she probably wanted child support. She probably wanted to get alimony from him saying that she was working while he was going to school now he's making money. Um, Three hundred entries in a in a in a divorce with kids. That's a lot. You shouldn't have that many uh, because they in Florida they make you go to mediation. I don't know where the divorce took place, but uh, I don't know if it was Florida. Was the divorce in Florida? Did we know that? Yes. Yes, it yeah. was. Oh, I'm they just reading. Her, they, yeah. they flew her across country, according to Diana Wilson. There you go. Oh, they flew her. Okay. Well, that's easier for everybody. It's probably cheaper too, and probably safer. Uh, but that's a lot. The, 
family law is the worst. And I've told people this, you got good people on their worst behavior. Criminal law, you got bad people on their best behavior. And the most dangerous thing is for an officer is going to a domestic violence place. And the most dangerous thing for a lawyer is handling a family law case with child custody or dog custody issues because people take it personally and they get desperate and they do desperate things. Uh, this is an interesting question, which is uh, I'll throw to Monica. It's her her uh, purview here, if you will, from Matthew Newton. Uh, Monica, does requesting the death penalty in a case have a psychological effect on the jury and make them think, quote, this person must be guilty or they wouldn't go for capital punishment? That's interesting. That's not what I thought the question would be. But I guess there's sort of a built in bias since it is a death penalty case. This person must be guilty. Uh, what do you say to that? I think, you know, jurors are human beings. And I absolutely think there is a human element and an emotional element to that. When you say the government is seeking, when it says the state of Florida, the United States of America versus John Smith, and we're seeking the death penalty, you immediately perk up a little bit and you're like, oh, 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 Jesus, let me start thinking of my excuse to get out of jury duty. Like, you know, <laughs> or, you know, oh, yeah, I want to be a part of this. I want to, you know, weigh in on this. I think it does. I think people, I think it's just human nature. We tell them all the time, you're not allowed to do that. You're not supposed to do that. You're not, you know, but I think it's just human nature. It makes you think, oh, I mean, it's really no different than if you're working on a child porn case or a uh, sexual molestation of a child. The second they read the information, Oh God. Tim and I watch the jury and we're like, oh God, like we did, like we knew the case was bad enough. Now it's mm. like, who's going to call in a bomb threat? Um, it's bad. <laughs> and so you see, you just see it in their face. So I agree with that um, comment. I, I think it does have a little bit of a psychological Im implied bias, implicit bias. You know, you're like, oh Jesus, this is going to be serious. Uh, Dwayne Harris, happy to have you here. Um, I feel like I know a Dwayne Harris. I have to think about this, but uh, he had a question, COE, about a membership. Uh, Dwayne, oh, look at this. There it is. I just hit the join button. Look how fast the COE is. I just hit the join button, but it didn't acknowledge my membership. What should I do? Please, thank you. Uh, surviving the Survivor at Gmail. Uh, the COE will take care of that. Uh, that is out of my realm of uh, duties because I know nothing about technology. <laughs> I don't even know what YouTube is, actually. I have no idea. Um, I remember when it first started back, I guess it was 2007. I said, this has got to be the dumbest idea in the world. And I said that about Amazon, too. Who the hell is going to buy a book online? Um, literally the you dumbest go idea. Go to a bookstore. Yeah, you just go to a bookstore. Uh, Jeff Bezos obviously thought saw things a little bit differently. That's probably why I'm hosting a podcast out of the corner of my room, um, and I can't even get the Wi-Fi right in the office that I'm spending money to rent. So that's my life. And uh, next time someone says you should – by the way, today the COE, this is another genius idea, waited six hours for the tow truck. She said, and I quote, there should be an Uber for tow trucks. In other words – you should just on demand a tow truck. Whoever's nearest comes to you first instead of waiting. You always have to wait six hours for a tow truck. If I had any understanding of coding, I would code that tonight. Uh, don't give away my business ideas. Bugs, the last thing you're ever going to do is code that, but I would love to see it. Uh, this was a great show. Thank you, Joel, and best guests. I've officially run out of things to say. I think actually this story is incredibly fascinating uh, too. Really, really fascinating. Ned Smith. I love this guy. First of all, I love his name, Ned Smith. He has jury duty tomorrow. I feel like I could be friends with Ned Smith. He's got like a funny sense of humor. By the way, America's uh, most famous troll. Uh, what, what the hell is his name? I just saw Ski Hat Sarah. I'm blanking on his name. What is his name? It's a, uh, it's a Murdoch thing. Anyway, where the hell has he been? I haven't seen our troll in a long time. COE, what's the name of that? Uh, Oh, look at this. Dwayne Harris says, Joel, I think it worked. You're welcoming me. Right. Mo Dean. That's it. Mo Dean. He used to go by an Alec Murdoch. Where is Mo Dean? I haven't seen Mo Dean. Uh, KCL, thank you. Don't thank us. Tim and Monica, excellent show tonight. Appreciate that. 
Uh, I had start a couple of quick comments. What I do with that? What do I do here? Oh my God, my oh here we go. Uh, there was something I don't know. Anyway, people said they love Monica. They loved him. What else do you need to know? Tomorrow night, uh, 5 p.m. Eastern. I'm doing two shows tomorrow. Oh, by the way, this is what I meant to say. Uh, before I tr saved a cat's life by swerving and causing a flat tire on my car, I was going to Mitsuri and actually to the site where Katie Magbanawa was arrested for our tour. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think I'm getting there because now I don't have a car. However, I just said, I don't think I'm getting there. Don't make promises. So tomorrow, the COE is going to have a newly edited crisp version with shots you haven't seen of the Adelson family South Florida tour. We're going to post that at 1230. This is a, a trifecta tomorrow. Then at 5 p.m. Eastern time, we are going to have an a exclusive interview with Patty Moore and the mother of Rachel Moore. And please come to that to support her. Her daughter was murdered back on August 5th, I want to say. It's been four plus months. They don't know who the suspect is. Please support her. And then at 7 p.m., we're back on this, looking at this and the Adelsons and the psychology behind it. So until then, loved having you here. Loved him. Love Monica, the best in the business, best guest, better community. Love you, America. Love you, Tallahassee. Love you, Jacksonville, and everyone near and far between. Oh, wait, I have to hit the outro. Thank <laughs> you.